continuation of chapter 6 where Donelza goes off to Falmouth with Judd to seek out Captain Blaney. They were directed to one of the better houses, with a room built out over the front door to form a pillared porch. This was more imposing than she had expected. She got down stiffly and told Judd to hold her horse. Her habit was thick with dust, but she knew of no place to go and tidy herself. I'll not be long, she said. Don't go away and don't get drunk or I'll ride on without you. Drunk, said Judd, wiping his head. No one has the call to leave that at my door. Minutes the week as passes, there's never a drop of liquor. Minutes the time I ain't gotten the spittle for a fair good spit. That dry, and you says drunk. You says drunk, why I mind the time when you was tiddly on account of finding a bottle of grog, and twas. Stay here, said the Melzer, turning her back. I'll not be gone long. She pulled at the bell. Judd was a spectre of old times. Forget him. Face this. What would Ross say if he could see her now? And Verity, base treason. She wished she had never come. She wished the door opened and Judd's grumbling died away. I wish to see Captain Blaney, please. He been in, ma'am. He did say he'd be back afore noon. Would he wait? Yes, said Demelza, swallowing and going in. She was shown conversationally into a pleasant square room on the first floor. It was panelled with cream-painted wood, and there was a model ship among the littered papers on the desk. "'What name shall I tell him?' asked the old woman, coming to the end of her chatter. At the last moment, Demelza withheld the vital word. "'I'd better prefer to tell him that myself. Just say as a someone.' "'Very well, ma'am.' The door closed. Demelza's heart was thumping in her breast. She listened to the woman's self-important footsteps receding down the stairs. The document on the desk took her curiosity. She was afraid to go over and peer at them, and her reading was still so slow. A miniature by the window, not Verity, his first wife whom he had knocked down to die, little framed silhouette of two children, she had forgotten his children, a painting of another ship, he looked like a man of war, from here she found she could see the lane outside. She edged nearer the window, Judge shiny head, a woman selling oranges, he was swearing at her, now she was swearing back. Judd seemed scandalised that anyone could match his own bad words. Captain Blamey, she would say, I have come to see ye, to see you about my cousin. No, first she best make sure he was not married again to someone else. Captain Blamey, she would begin, are you married again? Well, she couldn't say that. What did she hope to do? Leave it alone, Ross had warned. It's dangerous to tamper with other people's lives. That was what she was doing, against all orders all advice. There was a map on the desk. Lines were traced across it in red ink. She was about to go and look when another noise in the street drew her notice again. Under a tree a hundred yards back were a group of seamen, a rough lot, bearded and pigtailed and ragged. But in the middle of them was a man in a cocked hat talking to them in some annoyance. They pressed around him, angry and gesticulating, and for a moment he seemed to disappear among them. Then his hat showed again. The men stepped back to let him through, but several still shouted and shook their fists. The group closed up behind, and they stood together staring after him. One picked up a stone, but another grasped his arm and stopped him from throwing it. The man in the cocked hat walked on without glancing behind. As he came nearer the house, Demelza felt as if the lining of her stomach was giving way. She knew by instinct that this was the person she had plotted and schemed and risen twenty miles to see. But for all Ross's warnings, she had not imagined he would be like this. Did he never do anything but quarrel with people? And was this the man for loss of whom Verity was sear and yellow before her time? In a flash, Demelza saw the other side of the picture, which up till now had evaded her, that Francis and old Charles and Ross might be right and Verity's instinct at fault, not theirs. In panic, she looked at the door to gauge her chance of escape, but the outer door slammed, and she knew it was too late. 
There was no drawing back now. She stood rigidly by the windows and listened to the voices below in the hall. Then she heard a tread on the stairs. He came in, his face still set in hard lines from his quarrel with the seamen. She first thought what was her first thought was that he was old. He had taken off his cocked hat and wore his own hair. It was grey at the temples and specked with grey on the crown. He must be over forty. His eyes were blue and fierce, and the skin was drawn up around them from peering into the sun. They were the eyes of a man who might have been holding himself always ready for the first leap forward in a race. He came across to the desk and put his hat on it, looked directly at the visitor. My name is Cap is Blamey, ma'am, he said in a hard, clear voice. Can I be of service to you? Alder Melsa's prepared openings were forgotten. She was overawed by his manner and his authority. She moistened her lips and said, My name is Poldark. It was as if some key had turned in the inner mechanism of this hard man, locking away before it could escape any show of surprise or sentiment. He bowed slightly. "'I haven't the honour of your acquaintance.' "'No, sir,' said de Melza. "'No, you do know my husband, Captain Ross Poldark.' "'There was something ship-like about his face, "'jutting and aggressive and square, weathered but unbeaten. "'A few years ago I had occasion to meet him.' "'She could not shape the next sentence. "'With her hand she felt the chair behind her and sat in it. "'I rode twenty miles to see you. "'I am honoured. "'Ross don't know I've come,' she said. "'Nobody knows I've come.' "'His unflinching eyes for a moment left her face "'and travelled over her dusty dress. "'I can offer you some refreshment. "'No, no, I must leave again in a few minutes. "'Perhaps that was a mistake, "'for tea or anything would have given her ease and time.' There was a strained pause. Under the window, the quarrel with the orange woman broke out afresh. "'Was that your servant at the door?' "'Yes. I thought I recognised him. I should have known.' His voice left no doubt of his feelings. She tried once again. "'I... maybe I... I shouldn't have ought to have come, but I felt I must. I wanted to see you.' "'Well?' "'It is about Verity.' Just for a moment his expression grew embarrassed. That name could no longer be mentioned. Then he abruptly glanced at the clock. I can spare you three minutes. Something in the glance quenched the last of Demelza's hopes. I've been wrong to come, she said. I think there's some nothing to say to you. I made a mistake, that's all. Well, what is it you made a mistake in? Since you are here, you'd best say it. Nothing, nothing will be any use saying to the likes of you. He gave her a furious look. I ask you to tell me. She glanced at him again. It is about Verity. Ross married me last year. I knew nothing about Verity till then, and she never told me a thing. I persuaded it out of Ross. About you, I mean. I love Verity. I'd give anything to see her happy. And she isn't happy. She's never got over it. She's not not the sort to get over it. Ross said it was dangerous to meddle. He said I must leave it alone, but I couldn't leave it alone till I'd seen you. I I thought Verity was right and they was wrong. I I had to be sure they was right before I could let it drop. Her voice seemed to go on and on into an arid, empty space. She said, Are you married again? No. I schemed today. Ross had gone to Bobman. I borrowed the horses and came over with Judd. I'd best be getting back, for I've a young baby at home. She got up and slowly made for the door. He caught her arm as she went past him. Is Verity ill? No, Demelza said angrily. Ailing, but not ill. She looks ten years older than her age. His eyes were suddenly fierce with pain. Do you know... Sorry.